Yeah, just as I anticipated, there's uh, less and less students in the class. But uh, it's fine. Attendance is not uh, required. I just let you know that if you can't join the class, like uh, this morning, I'm trying to take a bus. And then I was stuck at the bus station <laughs> for <laughs> like uh, 20 minutes. And in the end, I had to take an Uber here. So, uh, so that's why I know that uh, it's very difficult to commute to school in the very early morning. And then if you want to join the class uh, over Zoom, you can go to the Canva, uh, Canvas uh, class syllabus. If you scroll down, you will see all the Zoom link. And you, as you can see, every uh, of our lecture has been uh, put on Zoom. And also, there's media gallery. Uh, if you click this media gallery, anyway, you should be able to see the uh, recorded postcast uh, of our lecture. OK? So uh, that's good. OK, so uh, let's start uh, the lecture today. Uh, so uh, welcome, everyone, to 130B, uh, quantum mechanics. So today we will continue our discussion about quantum states. Let me first review what we have learned last time about quantum states. Uh, so last time, we have started from the very important first postulate of quantum mechanics. Postulate one says that the state of a quantum system is always described by a vector in an associated Hilbert space. So every state is a vector. This vector can either be a column vector, like a cat vector, or it can be its dual vector, which is a bra vector, which is a row vector. And since the cat vector and bra vector, they encode exactly the same amount of information about the state, so uh, you can choose either one to describe the state of the system. And in quantum mechanics, the convention is to choose the cat vector. And the bra vector will only be useful when we talk about scalar product. So a cat vector is an comp array of complex uh, numbers uh, uh, arranged in a, row, uh, in a column. And then the bra vector will be a row. They are related by this uh, uh, transpose followed by complex conjugation. Both cat vector and bra vector can be uh, uh, decomposed into basis vectors uh, in, in the form of linear combination, uh, or like that. The other way, linear combination. But the only difference is that their linear combination coefficients are also associated, with, uh, associated to each other by complex conjugation. So a very fundamental property of vector, or the defining property of vector in mathematics, is uh, the property to linear combine them. So uh, if you have a system which has some states uh, described by vectors, then you can always linear combine the vector, and that is still a vector in the same vector space, meaning that that's still a legitimate, legitimate quantum state describing the quantum system. So a quantum system, instead of describing by a specific vector, uh, we can think of it as described by actually a vector space. A vector space is a space of all possible vectors uh, that, can be, uh, uh, that can be reached by a linear combination. So this is the idea of vector space. OK, so uh, last, uh, last time we also uh, touched the idea of scalar product. Uh, a vector space uh, further equipped with this uh, structure of scalar product will promote it into a uh, Hilbert space, uh, as we will explain more later. So scalar product is an operation that is defined between two states, uh, uh, either two different states. You can also, two, uh, even if it is two same vector, you can also define uh, scalar product. So if you have two vectors, the scalar product basically is you put a uh, bra and cat together to form a bracket. And the bracket, uh, basically the result is a scalar because uh, if you uh, take this uh, column vector and row vector and multiply them following the rules of matrix multiplication, you will see that the result is basically like this, which is a scalar. So every component, you just need to complex conjugate u i times v i and then sum over them. So uh, if, a if a vector is scalar product with itself, uh, that there is a very nice property. If you substitute this into this formula, v i star v i, which is, positive, which is never uh, negative, so which is greater or equal than 0, so the summation of a bunch of positive numbers is still positive. So this is a very important property. And another property is that if you have two states, and then the scalar product between u and v and v and u are simply complex conjugation to each other. 
And based on this uh, positivity property, people can prove uh, inequality, which is called Koch Schwarz inequality, uh, which uh, you can, uh, if you are curious of the proof, you can take a look at the uh, exercise one. So as I said, all uh, vectors form a vector space. Uh, uh, when we define vector space, we only require vectors to be able to linear combine with each other. But if you further allow the vector to have a structure like a scalar product, uh, you can actually promote the vector space into Hilbert space. And in quantum mechanics, all states, not only they can linear combine, they also have their dual states. Every cat has a dual bra, such that you can always define scalar product between any two states in the Hilbert space. So that's why uh, quantum systems are all described all by the Hilbert space. And given the concept of scalar product, there are two very important ideas. One is called normalization. The other is called orthogonality. So first of all, normalization is a property of a state with itself. So a, a, a state is said to be normalized if its a, a scalar product with itself is, uh, is unity, uh, is one. So for example, the scalar product of a state with itself is also often usually denoted as this vector and then take the, uh, uh, take the norm square. So this uh, V uh, with a double uh, vertical line denotes the norm of the vector, which is always defined as the scalar product of the vector with itself, and then take a square root. Remember that the scalar product of a vector with itself is always greater or equal than 0, so the square root is well defined for these uh, positive numbers. And then the square root is called the norm of the vector, and then maybe the scalar product is called the squared norm of the vector. And a state is normalized if and only if its norm is 1, which means this equality uh, is uh, holds. And then, for example, let's consider a qubit state. A qubit state is a state, that has, uh, a state vector that has two components. Uh, by saying that it's normalized, meaning that uh, if you take the scalar product of the vector with itself, it goes like v0, square, uh, v0 star v0 plus v1 star v1. Uh, the norm of the uh, first component, which is a complex number, and this, uh, this is the absolute value square of the second complex component. And if these two numbers add up to one, then uh, we say this vector is normalized. In general, you may encounter a vector which has multiple components, more than two components, maybe n components. Then you need to basically compute this uh, uh, scalar product with this itself and then uh, confirm that whether or not this vector is normalized by checking whether this uh, norm is uh, uh, one or not. So according to the statistical interpretation of quantum state, this VI actually has a physical meaning. Although VI itself, as a component of the state vector, doesn't have a, a direct physical meaning, but its uh, absolute value square, which is this complex number, once you take absolute value square, you can, show, uh, uh, you can uh, uh, ensure that this is, a, this is a positive number. And then it's, this equation basically means there is a bunch of positive numbers summing to 1. So this is exactly the, uh, very similar to the, uh, to the situation that you have a bunch of uh, probability and then the probability, every uh, probability is positive, and then they sum to 1. So this VI uh, norm square is exactly the probability to observe the system. S suppose the system was prepared in this V state, and then you want to ask, uh, given that condition, what's the probability to observe the system in the I spaces state, which may not be the V state, which may be uh, V state is a linear combination of the, all these basis states. So each basis state has a chance to be observed, and the chance or the probability to observe that particular basis state is associated with its linear combination coefficient uh, absolute value square, which is this probability. So the normalization condition of a quantum state simply implies that the probability must sum up to unity, which is a very physical uh, requirement. So that's why in quantum mechanics, when we talk about quantum states, we always talk about normalized vectors. And then if a vector is not normalized, you can make it normalized by normalization. Normalization of a state is to take a state vector, which may, may or may not be normalized, and divide by the norm of the vector. And then once you do that, uh, you can check that uh, you can normalize the state. Uh, for example, there's an exercise. Uh, exercise is not required, but you can uh, try to think about it. This is not a normalized state. And then try to think about how to normalize this uh, state vector. So normalization is the concept of a state with itself. 
And orthogonality is a concept of state with another state. So orthogonality is also related to the scalar product of states or state vectors. So if you have two states described by two vectors, u and v, these two vectors are said to be orthogonal if their scalar product is zero. So, uh, so that is actually uh, similar to uh, if you have uh, real vectors in two-dimensional space, then uh, as we learned previously, maybe in high school physics, that uh, this uh, inner product of these two uh, vectors, if, if the inner product is zero, then that means the two vector points to the orthogonal directions. They are 90 degrees to each other. Uh, so, so that's the idea. Although in quantum mechanics, these state vectors are complex vector and has multiple components. So in that sense, uh, the, the, uh, the physical picture of direction may not be very well defined. So you can't really uh, maybe say whether it's a 90 degree or not. But, uh, but we still use this idea or, or this word orthogonality to describe the situation where the scalar product of two vectors is zero. For example, uh, in a qubit system, we have two orthogonal states, uh, which is exactly the basis state. Uh, the ba there are two basis states, 0 and 1. So 0 is represented as a one-hot vector whose first component is 1. And the 1 is re represented by another one-hot vector whose second component is 1. So now if you take the inner product or the scalar product of these two vectors, as you can see, following the matrix multiplication rule, that the result is 0. And that basically means that 0 and 1 are orthogonal to each other. And then why they are orthogonal to each other? They are orthogonal for a good reason. Because 0 and 1 are exactly two distinct states of a qubit. That means if a qubit is observed to be the, in the state 0, it's definitely not in the state 1. So uh, sometimes the qubit can be prepared in a superposition state of 0 and 1. In that case, you may have some probability to observe it in 0 or observe it in 1. But if the qubit is just like a, the one state, then if the system is prepared, or this qubit system is prepared in the one state, then there's no chance that you can uh, make a further observation and, and confirm that the system is in the zero state, because these two labels uh, uh, are created to label distinct states. So in classical mechanics, any two states labeled by different, uh, for example, momentum or coordinate, are treated as distinct states. But in quantum mechanics, sometimes we may have different labels of the state, but the corresponding state, for example, U and V are two different labels for a state. But uh, whether these two states are distinct or not, uh, it still depends on uh, whether their uh, scalar product is zero or not. So distinct states means that their scalar product is zero, and, uh, uh, and physically that means if you are in one state, there's no probability to confirm it in the other state. So you can distinguish them in that sense. <clears throat> Any questions about scalar product? OK, so I think uh, as a summary, we have introduced the idea or the mathematical definition of scalar product between two vectors. And then uh, the scalar product is associated with two, uh, two concepts. One is called the normalization or uh, uh, a state. It, it describes the scalar product of a, uh, a vector with itself to be 1, then the vector is normalized. And then there's another concept called orthogonality. If you have two vectors, uh, when their scalar product is 0, they are orthogonal to each other. OK, with this normalization and orthogonality, we can further describe an orthonormal basis. So when we want to describe quantum system with vectors, in, in many cases, it's very convenient to write the vector in, uh, as a linear combination of a bunch of basis vectors. And uh, the basis, uh, which, is like, uh, uh, which is like unit vectors that specify the coordinate systems of your vector space, uh, in like a linear algebra, we know that the basis doesn't need to be orthogonal to each other. But it's always very convenient to consider orthogonal basis. So that, that's like if you want to de describe a two-dimensional or maybe three-dimensional space, like in our uh, real world, then you say x, y, and z are three uh, unit vectors along three orthogonal directions. So you can describe any point in the, uh, the three-dimensional uh, space with uh, three numbers which are independent from each other. So orthogonal basis, in many cases, has advantage. In quantum mechanics, although we are dealing with complex vectors, which does not have this very clear geometric meaning, but we still uh, uh, want to use this idea of orthogonal basis. Orthogonal basis is a set of cat vectors uh, labeled by the basis index, 
which may go from 1 to n. And then these vectors are said to be orthonormal. You can see orthonormal is a word which is combined by orthogonality and normalization. And it's a combination of these two properties. So that means the, 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 the vectors in this set of cats, every cat by itself is normalized because normalization is a relation of a vector to itself. And then between every pair of vectors, they are orthogonal. That's a relation between uh, two vectors, right? So that, that basically means that if you take the scalar product of a basis i and basis j, the result will be a delta symbol. Remember that the delta symbol means that when i equals j, then we are talking about the scalar product of a state, a basis state with itself. Then because it's with itself, and with itself it must be normalized, that means the scalar product must be 1 in this case. But if i not equal to j, that means you are talking about two distinct basis states. Then uh, in, in that case, as a, as a basis state in an orthonormal basis, the orthogonality uh, condition requires that the inner product uh, or the scalar product goes to 0. So if you have a, a, a result which depends on two indices, i and j, and then when i only i equals j, the result is 1, then that basically is the delta symbol. That's the chronic delta symbol. That's what we defined previously as the matrix element of an identity matrix. OK, so this is the defining uh, uh, property of an orthonormal basis. That means you have a set of cats satisfying these properties for every i and j, then uh, the, the set of uh, cats is uh, set to form an orthonormal basis. So each orthonormal basis state describes a distinct reality of the quantum system. And then the orthonormal basis can be uh, very uh, nicely represented by one hot vectors. And because one hot vectors are by definition <laughs> orthogonal and then normalized uh, at the same time. For example, you can consider uh, if the system has n such states, and then you can use an n dimensional vector, uh, which means that it's a vector with n component. And the first basis state will be 1 followed by a bunch of 0. And the second basis will have this 1 moving to the second component. And the third basis will have this 1 moving to the third component. But there, only, there will be only a single 1 in among all the components. So that's why the vector is called 1 hot. Yes? This is just a convenient way to represent the vector. Uh, it, the, the, there's not a unique choice of this uh, orthonormal basis. Uh, you may choose some non-one-hot representation as long as you ensure that every vector in your basis are normalized and orthogonal to each other. It's a legitimate representation of the orthonormal basis. It's just a convenient <laughs> canonical choice that in this way, you don't need to think about it. <laughs> Otherwise, you need to check and think about it. And exactly the question, uh, sorry, I need to repeat the question, was about whether uh, there's other way to choose uh, uh, representations of orthonormal basis. And the answer is yes. And indeed, this is a very interesting question. And we will have a homework, actually, <laughs> uh, uh, about this question, which asks you, uh, we will see that later, uh, to find uh, other representations of orthonormal uh, basis for a qubit. OK, so, uh, uh, so uh, with, uh, with this convention, uh, we can always choose bases in this way. And it turns out that the, uh, by doing this, it's also very help, helpful uh, in quantum mechanics. Uh, sometimes you don't want to work with very abstract Dirac notations, cat and bra. Uh, sometimes you want to uh, see these vectors. So it's all, always very uh, useful to represent linear combination of basis vectors using this explicit vector uh, representation. OK. So uh, we have touched upon the Hil idea of Hilbert space, which is basically the vector space of all cats. And then uh, once we define a set of orthonormal bases, we can actually use this uh, set of bases to define a Hilbert space. A Hilbert space is a vector space spanned by a set of orthonormal bases, meaning that uh, orthonormal bases is a set of vectors uh, orthogonal to each other. That means you have already specified what are the unit vectors in different directions, right? You have already specified the, uh, the coordinate system by <laughs> specifying orthonormal basis. Then you, this kind of a 
uh, coordinate system also specify the whole space because the whole space is just made of all possible linear combination of these basis states. So uh, the dimension of the Hilbert space uh, is basically the number of basis vectors. For example, a three-dimensional space, meaning that you have x, y, z, three basis vectors. And that is also, by uh, more rigorously in math, the definition of dimension of vector space is the maximal number of linearly independent vectors. Uh, linearly in independent meaning that two vectors are not along the same line. For example, in a three-dimensional space, you can find at most three linearly independent vectors. Questions? OK, so this is the idea of a Hilbert space dimension. In quantum mechanics, Hilbert space dimension can either be finite or infinite. For example, if you have a qubit, qubit has two distinct states, and that's why it has two bases. And correspondingly, Hilbert space dimension is two. And these two uh, basis states are uh, denoted as 0 and 1. And then if you have 10 qubits, meaning that you have uh, repeat, you copy these qubits 10 times, then uh, every qubit can independently take the state 0 or 1. So if you have 10 qubits, all the, all the possible state is 2 times 2 times 2 all the way 10 times. So if you have 2 multiply with itself 10 times, the result is 2 to the power 10, which is 1,024. So a, a 10 qubit system will have uh, 1,000, <laughs> about 1,000, 1,024 uh, uh, dimension of the Hilbert space. So you can see that the Hilbert space dimension grows very rapidly with the number of qubits, uh, actually grows exponentially. And that's, that's both an opportunity and a challenge in quantum computation. So, uh, uh, so the reason that quantum, quantum computer is very powerful is because quantum computer was able to encode a large amount of information in a few number of qubits. Only for 10 qubits, it can provide a vector <laughs> which has a length of 1,024, right? 1,024, that means this vector has 1,024 components, and each component can, uh, is a complex, uh, complex number that can independently encode some amount of information. So it's very efficient a way to encode information in these qubits, only in 10 qubits. You can encode a lot of information. If you can make 100 qubits, you can encode even much more information. So that's why it's very powerful, but it's also very challenging because uh, that means in order to understand the behavior of these quantum many-body systems, it becomes very difficult to do computation on classical computer because modern classical computer, I think, can handle like a 50 qubits, you can represent, you can still store that vector in your, uh, in your classical computing device, but if you have 100 qubits, the, the length of the vector, <laughs> the state vector is too long that it becomes impossible to store them in any uh, classical device. So we don't know how to simulate these uh, behavior of these quantum computers. So, uh, so that's also the challenge. But that's also the point. Uh, the, the, the reason that quantum computer is uh, more powerful than classical computer is because there are some uh, states on the quantum computer that the classical computer cannot simulate. OK, so those are examples of Hilbert space of finite dimension. But there are also examples where Hilbert space takes an uh, infinite dimension. For example, if you have a particle in a continuous space, like a particle along a line, then uh, you may uh, label the particle by its coordinate. But coordinate is a physical observable. If coordinate takes different value, different real number values, then that correspond to distinct quantum states. So in this case, the, uh, the basis state will be labeled by a continuous variable, which correspond to the coordinate of the particle. And that no longer takes discrete value. Instead, it takes all possible real values. And that goes to infinity. So that's why the dimension of the Hilbert space in that case is also infinite. So it's OK to talk about infinite dimensional Hilbert space in quantum mechanics. But if, if, I, if I say that, then there's a concern. <laughs> How should I choose the dimension of the Hilbert space? Actually, dimension of Hilbert space is a choice. It's not, uh, it's not given, because we don't really know how many states are there in our universe, right? So if you want to describe uh, the quantum state of uh, our universe, then probably you need to take care of every atom, right? But maybe people will tell you atom is not enough, because atom is still made of electrons and nucleus. So you also need to consider quantum states of these electrons and nucleus. But that's not enough. Nucleus is made of protons, uh, nu neutrons, and, and maybe even made of quarks. And maybe at the most fundamental level, they are made of strings 
or they are made of qubits, who knows, right? So we, we don't even know what is the most fundamental structure of our universe. So there's no way to actually say precisely what is the most complete description of my quantum system. So when we do physics, it's the goal, we say, physics theory need to provide description power, but it's not mean to provide infinite description power. You need to have a cutoff of your description power. You need to deliberately forget about something. For example, if you want to discuss chemical reactions, Chemical reactions is only about electron jumping from one molecule to another molecule, or, or the motion of electron between molecules or atoms. So in that case, you don't need to worry about what the quark is doing inside the nucleus, right? So you need to have a cutoff of your description, saying that energy scale cutoff, or maybe the length scale cutoff. I don't want to consider structures smaller than certain length scale. So that sets a cutoff of your Hilbert space. So when we talk about qubit, for example, in quantum computing, Computer. These qubits are actually made of, for example, Rydberg atoms has a ground state and an excited, excited state that can be treated as two states. Or a spin of an electron can, can be up or down that can be treated as two states. So we never worry about how to realize this two-state system. Instead, just saying that, OK, we set a cutoff of our, of our description, and now the Hilbert space dimension becomes two. But in reality, those Rydberg atom actually contains more degrees of freedom whose Hilbert space dimension, if you want to describe more phenomena, maybe it's also infinity. So, uh, so that's why uh, the choice of a Hilbert space dimension is depending on us. And we, we only care about those states that are relevant to us. And for a qubit system, uh, for example, we only care about zero and one. And they form distinct reality of the qubit system. So once you make a choice of the dimension of your Hilbert space, meaning that I only want to look at all these uh, basis states and the linear combination of these basis states, uh, that, that, and that's, that's fine. Once you make that assumption, then there's an idea of completeness. Completeness meaning that once we specify the Hilbert space dimension, and then the, the full set of distinct, uh, any full set of uh, distinct states in the Hilbert space form a complete set of orthonormal bases such that every state in the Hilbert space can be uh, expanded as a linear combination of these basis state, meaning that once you set up the coordinate system, <laughs> there's no vector that, is, uh, that cannot be represented by these uh, coordinates, right? So once you set up the basis, there's no vector that cannot be represented as a linear combination of them. So any vector can be uh, written in this form, and then each basis state describes a distinct reality of the quantum system. And the superposition coefficient are the component of the state vector, which can also be written in terms of a scalar product of the vector with the basis state. So if you want to know what is the, what is the component, for example, V2 in front of the second basis, you just need to take the uh, cat vector and then in the product or scalar product with the second basis, that will automatically extract the coefficient for you. So because of this reason, uh, sometimes people also rewrite, rewrite this uh, linear combination formula, uh, that formula, right? This VI, because it can be written as a scalar product. So you can substitute this scalar product to there, and that becomes this equation. This equation, uh, don't be scared by the Dirac notation. This is a cat, this is a bra. And bra and cat put together becomes a scalar. So this is actually, although it looks very complicated, but it's a number. And then this is a cat, which is a vector. So you are linearly combine these vectors with these numbers, and the result is a vector, right? So everything makes sense. So uh, that's also a way that people use to write uh, uh, linear combinations. But this way, you can see, you, you, you only need to use cat and bra to write everything down. And then there is a statistical interpretation associated with this uh, combination coefficient or the, uh, or the uh, state vector components. So if a quantum state is known to be in a superposition state uh, described by a vector V, uh, which is a linear combination of all the basis i's, and then the, uh, uh, and then, uh, the, the idea is that if the system is described by this state or prepared to this state, then if you design an observation to discern which reality, different reality is represented by different distinct 
uh, basis states, right? So which reality the system is actually in, or actually being realized under the observation, and this kind of uh, uh, observation will find the system in the ice reality described by the ice basis state with a probability which is given by the uh, component vi uh, absolute value square or this uh, scalar product absolute value square. So this scalar product again is a complex number. So the uh, result is a positive number which describes this probability. So this probability basically reads given V, what is the probability to see that the system is in the I state? So it's like a conditional probability. So the conditional probability is exactly describing quantum mechanics. We use this model, use this vector to model this probability in this way, using this inner product to model the probability. Yeah? Yes, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, you may wa worry about <laughs> U and V, <laughs> and then uh, V and U. So uh, as we learn, uh, these two uh, scalar products, if you exchange their order, they are only differ by a complex conjugation. Complex conjugation is not going to affect uh, its uh, norm square. So two complex numbers conjugate to each other has exactly the same absolute value square. So that means this probability actually doesn't care <laughs> whether you're in the product, which one in the front, uh, if you want to compute that. Oh, so, oh, oh the, uh, about it. OK, this one. Yeah. OK. But it doesn't matter if the brown cat is on the left or the right. Oh, it doesn't matter because it's a number. As a number, you can write it in front uh, in the. <laughs> Right. So, so number means that the scalar product to a vector, so, uh, so it doesn't matter. But if it is a, uh, uh, but people usually, uh, it's better to write it in this way. The reason is that if you look at this expression from far, you can forget about all the bra and cats, all these brackets in the middle. You just look at what is the leftmost symbol and the rightmost symbol. That two two guys will basically become <laughs> become this uh, left uh, left uh, will basically indicates that it's a uh, it's a vector. So so if you look at this outermost uh, part, uh, if it looks like this, this means it's a cat vector. But if it's something like that, right? It's both uh, bra and cat. Then uh, it's a because bra and cat are very pointy <laughs> at here, so that's like a point. A point is like a scalar, so that's, uh, that's why people invent this notation to, uh, to remind ourselves in which case the result is a vector, in which case the result is a scalar, okay? Okay, so, uh, so uh, any questions? Okay, so uh, given, given the previous discussion, we are able to uh, further uh, uh, go, go further into this idea of uh, probability, uh, which is a very essential uh, point of uh, quantum mechanics. And then uh, uh, Boyne's rule is a, is a fundamental rule, which uh, tells us how to interpret the relation between two uh, state vectors. So, uh, so it's also telling us more generally how to calculate this conditional probability distribution. So there is a first concept which is called fidelity. Fidelity, f as a function of u and v, u and v are two state vectors. Uh, so, so the fidelity between two state vectors, u and v, is denoted as this uh, f of u and v. Uh, this, is a, this, this f is supposed to be a number, and this number will quantify the similarity or the overlap between these two states, u and v, described by their state vector. And it is defined to be given by the square of the absolute value of their scalar product, which is this formula. So it's exactly what we see, just uh, as we see previously. So fidelity, as I mentioned there, is symmetric because uh, it doesn't matter if you change the places between u and v, because once you take absolute value square, the answer will be the same. And fidelity also takes values in the range between 0 and 1. 
And this follows from the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality we just mentioned previously. So suppose both U and V states are normalized states, which is an uh, assumption in quantum mechanics. So uh, there, uh, this uh, scalar product uh, solute value square will be less equal than 1 times 1, which is 1. And on the other hand, as an absolute value square, it will also be greater or equal than 0. So this fidelity will be a number which is between 0 and 1. So if you ever encounter a number between 0 and 1, that's very much a probability, right? Probability, you either have, at most, you have 100% of probability. That means an event will happen for sure. Or you may have 0% of probability. That means the event will not happen. <laughs> so, uh, so that's indeed the case. Uh, people use, uh, on one side, we can use fidelity to, to describe the similarity between two states. If the two states are orthogonal to each other, then the fidelity goes to zero. If the two states are the same state, then the fidelity goes to one. If the two states have some overlap between zero and one, that means there is some finite overlap, but maybe not orthogonal and not uh, identical. So, so fidelity has that usage. But that usage also overlap with this in, uh, probability interpretation. So, so this is uh, what people call hypothesis testing. <laughs> so if you want to describe the probability, uh, you always want to first come up with a hypothesis and try to test that. And the probability usually describes the probability for the test to pass or not. So the setup is like if a quantum system is prepared in the state V, then uh, uh, observation designed to check whether the system, whether the system is in another state labeled by U, uh, will return a comp confirmative answer with this probability. So that's just a very rigorous way of saying that if the system is already known to be in the V state, what is the probability to observe the system and find that the system is actually in the U state? So, uh, so that is given by a conditional probability distribution of uh, U condition on V, basically. And then that conditional probability distribution is described by the scalar product of, uh, between the state vectors. So that's why state vector is useful, because it encodes the relationship uh, or the, uh, uh, between different, uh, di different possible states. And then it tells you what's the probability to observe different states based on your current knowledge about the state of the system. So V basically encodes our current knowledge about the quantum state. And then U is a, is a new state. Maybe you will observe in the future. So, so this probability describes what's the uh, chance to see that event happen. So there's a nice property of this probability uh, uh, model in this way. Uh, that is uh, PUV equals PVU uh, equals the fidelity between U and V. So fidelity between U and V doesn't discern the difference uh, which one is uh, the first state, which one is the second state. So they are symmetric to each other. So that, that means there's a detailed balance in quantum system. If you start from a state V, you have the if you have a larger chance to, uh, to, uh, to observe it in state U, then it's also the same vice versa uh, from U to V. So the probability to transition from one state to another state is always the same as the probability to transition back. So that means there's no such a thing that you, can, you will transition to another state and then never get uh, the chance to go back, right? As long as you have the chance to go to another state, uh, there's always the same amount of chance to, uh, to return. So that's a very important property of detailed balance. And then, uh, and then given these uh, kind of definitions, we can, uh, we, we can look at three different uh, examples. One is identical states. If two states are identical, if and only if their fidelity is one, right? If they, are they have 100% overlap. So the fidelity being one, meaning that uh, the probability to observe U state on the V state is 100%, meaning that if you already know that the system is in the V state and try to check whether the system is U in the U state because U state is identical to V state, of course, you need to confirm this observation again with probability one. So, so that means the reality must be confirmable by repeated observations. Otherwise, it's not a reality. That's the definition of reality. Uh, something is real, meaning that you can measure it and confirm it and then measure it again and confirm it again, right? If you, every time you measure it, you, you get a different answer, then you cannot come up with the idea of reality. You don't know what's real. 
So uh, by saying that this state has, it has a reality associated with that, that means you can define identical state. You can define which two states are identical. For example, if a state vector is multiplied by a global phase vector, that doesn't give you a different state vector. Uh, uh, well, in terms of vector, it looks different, but it doesn't give you a different state. It's two different, similar, uh, two singly different <laughs> vectors describing exactly the same state because uh, these two state vectors are identical. So they describe the same reality. And then there are also cases where we encounter distinct states. Two states are distinct by definition is uh, if and only if their fidelity is zero. That means there's no overlap between these two states. They are orthogonal to each other. So two orthogonal states are distinct realities. Distinct reality means that it's, uh, able, we are able to distinguish uh, uh, the two states. Uh, distinct reality are distinguishable by repeated observation, meaning that if a quantum system is known to be in a state V, observing the, state, uh, uh, observing the system again will certainly not find the system in another orthogonal state. If, uh, if another state is orthogonal, that means it's in a, another world. It's not a superposition uh, that, uh, that involves this state V, right? So U doesn't have any component that is in the V state. So that's why if you already know that the system is in the V state, there's no chance to observe the system in a distinct state. So it's also very important. For example, for a qubit, we say there are two distinct realities, zero and one. That means if it is in a zero state, there's no chance to observe it in a one state. That's why we can, we can tell what is zero, what is one, right? So if, if zero and one are not distinct reality, if in the zero state you still have a finite chance to observe one, then you can't quite tell whether one, how much one is different from zero. So the fact that you never get a chance to observe the one state uh, if you're on the zero state, that, that uh, actually speaks for the fact that the qubit system actually has two distinct realities and then that spans a two-dimensional Hilbert space because you can use this orthogonal state to form orthonormal basis and that spans the Hilbert space. And, and these are two extreme cases, identical states and distinct states. And more general, uh, when we encounter arbitrary two states, uh, usually they are <laughs> overlapping. <laughs> So uh, usually, in general, without any specification, two different spaces may have partial overlap. They don't need to be identical, and they don't need to be orthogonal. So their fidelity is some number that falls between 0 and 1. For example, that means in quantum mechanics, reality can overlap. If you have two quantum states, uh, they can look similar. <laughs> Although maybe sometimes you use different labels, for example, 3 and 5, to label these two pictures. Uh, these pictures can also be thought as a state vector because you can uh, consider vector component being the value of the pixels. So these two pictures are similar, and, and, but, but not identical. They are not, also not uh, orthogonal. They have finite overlap. Yes? <clears throat> Yes. So that, so, so that means in quantum mechanics, whenever you put an overall phase factor, it's not going to do anything. So any overall phase factor in front of your state vector has no physical meaning. It's a redundancy. But it's fine because we say that a state vector is created to describe the state. Describe the state, meaning that you are creating some language to describe something. And language has redundancy. Redundancy in the state vector language is there in the overall phase vector. Yeah, you can always multiply every component by the same phase vector, although that results in a different state. But that's just different language for example, you can say Chinese or English to describe the same thing, uh, apple, pinguo, <laughs> in Chinese. So they sound very different, <laughs> but they're describing the same thing. So that's the same here in uh, quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, we are very careful in distinguishing state description and the observable. 
observable is something you can measure in the lab and get the number. <laughs> you measure the coordinate of a particle and then you get that number. <laughs> and then that's for sure. <laughs> you measure the qubit state and you get an answer whether it's zero or one. That's for sure. <laughs> and then how to describe zero, how to describe one, that's a choice of language. And then we choose to use state vector to describe it. Once we make that choice, language has ambiguity and redundancy. And that's the redundancy there. So uh, we always want to distinguish them. So it's wrong to say that different vectors will describe different states. So that's why we need to create this idea called distinct state, not different state. Uh, two state vector may look different. But whether they are distinct, you need to calculate their uh, uh, scalar product. For, or, or for example here, identical state. Uh, the two state vector, they are, they are, yes, they are different, but they are identical states, meaning that they are two different vector language describing the same state, the same reality. Yeah. <clears throat> OK. Any further questions? Yeah, I guess we have five minutes, so <laughs> let me give you the homework one. Uh, uh, homework one is a, access, uh, is a homework which uh, uh, I, I already posted that online. Uh, uh, you, can, you can try to finish that uh, uh, within the uh, due time. But, uh, but the homework due, as I mentioned in the syllabus, it's not a, a very hard due. Uh, so, so even if it's overdue, it's fine. It's, there's no uh, overdue penalty, but try to catch up with the pace of the homework such that you don't have pile all the homework towards the end of the quarter. So this homework is about a qubit. So uh, it, it, in fact, there are multiple ways to uh, describe orthogonal basis for a qubit in a two-dimensional Hilbert space. We have just mentioned zero and one uh, as two orthogonal or distinct reality of a qubit. It turns out that the qubit has many, many <laughs> pairs of distinct realities, and which people named it as a plus and minus, i and i bar, and things like that. And for now, of course, if I just give you these abstract names, they, they mean nothing. But let me try to uh, tell you what's the relationship between these states. For example, within each pair, the two states are orthogonal to each other, meaning that you can draw a picture like this. So you can draw a picture and put this, all these six different, uh, six different states uh, at these six different points. And then this, this graph basically describes their interrelation. For example, zero and one are two, uh, two states in the same pair. So, uh, so by this uh, requirement, they are orthogonal. That, that's, that's basically the description of this diagram, meaning that uh, this point and that point, there's no lines connecting them. <laughs> And then any point that has a line connecting them, that line describes how much overlap is there between these two state vectors. For example, 0 and i has a 50% of overlap. And it also has a 50% overlap with minus. It also has a 50% overlap with minus, uh, with i bar and plus. So, so that's how you read this diagram. So this diagram basically is what we described in the, uh, in the above that it describes there are six states in a two-dimensional Hilbert space, meaning that every state is this, can be described by a two-component complex vector. So now your goal is to find uh, or to assign <laughs> the vector <laughs> representation uh, for each one of these six states such that when you compute the overlap or the fidelity between every pair of the states, the fidelity can precisely match all these 50% notation along the graph, right? Is that uh, task clear? Yeah, so the question is, can you figure out the assignment of two component vector representation for these states that is consistent with their overlapping relation described in this graph? And the hint is to read lecture two <laughs> of, uh, of our textbook, which I didn't follow, but read this textbook, it's on it's in, in our syllabus. If, if you really don't know how to do it, you can read that. If you, if you already have good ideas, uh, you can do that using your way. So why this kind of problem is important? Because it's related to machine learning, a very important concept called attention mechanism. So nowadays, machine learning language model use attention mechanism to, 
to attend different words uh, in a sentence. And what we have is we have the relationship between the words, but we want to know how to embed this word as word vectors. And this exercise exactly is the exercise which try to find the vector representation of words, uh, for example, given the relationship between words. So OK, that's it for today. Yeah. Uh, questions? Um, so, uh, 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 OK. Yeah.